The world inhabited by the Haida was once housed within a box. The Haida origin stories chronicle the travels of Raven, a trickster figure whose exploits gave the Haida world its shape and helped to explain how the Haida cosmos was formed. According to Robin Wright, in the earliest times, there was only a boundless expanse of sea and sky with a single exposed reef upon which all the supernatural beings were heaped. Raven, who was unable to find a place to land, was forced to climb through the clouds and enter the sky country. Having no food to eat, Raven plucked out an eye from each of the people living in the first row of houses in the village. After four nights, a half-stone woman saw Raven doing this and alerted the village chief, who asked that everyone in the village sing a song for Raven. During the song, Raven fell through the clouds and landed in the sea. After floating in the ocean, Raven found the top of a house front pole and followed it down into a village under the sea. He entered a house and the man living there asked Raven to go into the box in the corner of the room. Raven opened the box and found four more boxes within it. In the last box were two long objects, one covered with shining points and the other one black. The old man instructed Raven how to place these objects in the water and the black object stretched out, becoming the Haida country. The other object became the mainland. Thus, the world inhabited by the Haida was the product of a black object housed within a box. This is an image of a black box in which nothing is stored. In fact, the box was never intended to store anything. This box, collected by James Swan in 1883 under the direction of Spencer Baird, the second secretary of the Smithsonian Institution and the head of the United States National Commission of Fish and Fisheries, is made of a type of argillite stone unique to Haida Gwaii, the home of the Haida Nation. The Haida carved objects out of argillite and traded them with collectors, whalers, and explorers as a way to supplement the sea otter fur trade. According to James Swan, these stone carvings are eagerly purchased by persons looking for Indian curiosities and are generally regarded by casual observers as idols, or objects of worship, or indicative in some manner of the secret or mystic rites. This, however, is an error. To an extent, Swan is correct. Argillite objects served no ceremonial purpose within the Haida community and were carved explicitly for trade with foreigners. Despite the fact that these boxes were not made for local use, they have profound meanings for the people that made them. The images of bears, mythical birds, and sea animals are not simply fanciful creatures meant to pique the interest of collectors of Indian curiosities. Embedded in the surface of this box is the histories of families, the ancestral spirits from whom they descend and derive their hereditary titles and spiritual power. For the makers of the boxes and other Argelite objects, the new medium that was spurred and supported by cross-cultural contact and exchange became a means by which artists could attempt to reaffirm their identities in a world that was rapidly changing due to disease, forced sedimentation, Christianization, and the introduction of colonial regimes. I am interested by the ways in which concepts of studium and punctum can apply to objects as well as photographs and images of objects. For the curiosity collector, argillite boxes were something in which they had a passing interest. Collectors seemed less concerned with the meanings embedded on the surface of the box than with the types of messages communicated by the box's presence in their home. Possessing boxes said something about who the collector was, his or her interests, or possibly spoke to his or her brush with the quote, noble savage. On his concept of studium, Barth's remarks, it is as if I had to read the photographer's myth in the photograph, fraternizing with them, but not quite believing in them. For collectors, the acknowledgement of the myths of the creator was enough to satisfy them. And what about the object's maker? What power, if any, does the object hold for the society that produced it? Barth discusses the concept of animation and the fact that certain images animate him in a way that others do not. The process of animation is reciprocal, and the photograph itself is similarly animated by his interaction with it. This concept of animation applies nicely to the Argelite box. At the most basic level, the process of carving sacred crest images is a process of animation and helps reproduce ancestral entities. Sacred knowledge is accessed by the production and reproduction of sacred images. Similarly, the artist's interaction with his ancestor spirit animates him. For instance, the central crest image on the box resembles the type of headdress frontlets worn above the head during ceremonial performances. Ceremonial regalia and headdress frontlets were the most complete representation of Haida personhood because the relationship between the chief's face and the crest image placed above it recalls who the person is and from where he derives his socio-religious authority, both of which speak to the wearer's place within the Haida world.
Barth's concept of punctum, the accident which pricks him, is interesting in the context of this box because it offers an opportunity for non-indigenous viewers to be affected by the image. For me, the punctum resides in the accidental flicker of light caused by the camera's flash in the abalone shell inlays. Something about this technological accident gives the crest animal a sense of life and animates the surface of the box. For contemporary native artist Lawrence Paul Yuxvalupton, it is the ovoids that adorn the surface of the box which animate the image, something inherent in its design that can only be understood by a native audience. He writes, Ovoids serve as a philosophy to think about such things as land claims, aboriginal rights, self-determination and self-government, social conditions and environmentalism, native reason and native philosophy. Perhaps the only way for me, as a non-indigenous viewer, to be affected by the box is through photography. The accident that pricks me can only be created by a lens and a flash of a camera, which may be my only way into the object at all.